This is Derek Blavin, and welcome back to episode 40 of How to Practice Jazz Guitar Efficiently. Now, in case this is the first video you've ever seen on this channel before, I'd recommend that you go back to episode 1 and try your best to watch the videos in order. I know that they're long, but you can take your time with it, but do that if you really want to benefit the most from this channel because this is like a free online jazz guitar course that unfolds in a logical sort of manner and it just keeps building upon itself, alright? But since you did click on this video today, maybe check it out first and see if you like it, and then you can take it from there. So today I'm going to continue this discussion of how we may go about simplifying how we approach the harmony when we're soloing over chord changes and various kinds of tunes and whatnot. And like I said in the last episode, the reason why I wanted to present you with a handful of examples here is because I feel that is how you really truly do become familiar with these different things that I'm talking about by basically recognizing these things over and over again in different examples that's how you'll really get it to the point where it becomes internalized or automatic where you don't have to think about it as much so I felt like it was a good idea to just give you a bunch of examples so you have something to start with and also I think it's good to keep in mind that for the rest of these examples that you'll see today and then in the next few videos to come, I'll definitely be making points that I haven't said yet in the first two parts of this topic in the last two videos, um, but I'm also likely going to be saying things that I have already said in those first two parts, and that's because, again, I really want to reinforce this stuff so that you don't have to think about it and you really want to see the similarities of how you find these things over and over again in a bunch of different tunes, alright? So, if you haven't seen the first two parts of this little topic here, maybe check those out as well. And finally, before I get into it today, you'll probably be relieved to hear that I decided in the end to really just finish out this little topic with mainly only doing one example per video. Originally, you know, I was always trying to fit a bunch of examples in one, and I already did that in the last episode, but I know they come out long, and I think that it'll be easier on everyone. This is literally the longest video on this channel up until this point. But I just want to let you know that before I really get into most of the changes of this tune today, I do ramble a lot about just the 1625 progression again and in a more generalized way. So a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say, you will be able to apply to lots of tunes because that progression is extremely common, obviously, but just Bear with me, I know it's a lot as always, and if you stick around to the end, I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me, and I hope you enjoy. And I think people like the topic of harmony anyway, so 
you know, this way you get more videos. So, that's just something to be aware of. There'll probably be at least three more videos, give or take, on just this topic after this one today. Okay, so, for the example today, we're going to be taking a look at the harmony for the great tune by Kenny Burrell, which also features John Coltrane, entitled Le Resto, which is off of their classic self-titled album. And this is what I played at the beginning of the video. Now, I made a PDF for the melody of this tune if anybody wants to check it out, and this will include the notation, the tabs, and the chord changes that go along with it, and basically what Kenny Burrell played on the recording. And this melody itself is great with a lot of nice phrases to check out. And also, I just wanted to make this side point right now and say that even though the melody isn't really the main focus of this video or this whole topic in general, this tune is one in particular, at least for me, that really taught me to appreciate playing a melody more so in the lower register or lower octaves on the guitar. This is probably because on the classic recording of this tune, Kenny Burrell doubles up playing the melody with Coltrane, but they play it in different octaves and Kenny Burrell takes the lower octave. And at least for me, when I'm learning a melody off a recording in a situation like that, I tend to transcribe the upper voice or register mainly, and plus, in this case, it's Coltrane, so obviously it's great. I think a lot of times, musicians can be trained or accustomed to hearing melodies that fall more so in a higher register or octave, so that it cuts through and can be clearly heard usually as the highest melodic voice in an entire arrangement. And in addition to this, if we were to look at the range of the guitar in particular, those lower octaves which melodies can often be played in may seem, you know, relatively low, and even pretty close to what you may consider to be the bass part region of the guitar, as if you were to create, you know, like a solo guitar arrangement. So, because of all of this, some guitarists, definitely me, oftentimes can default to playing melodies in the next highest octave or register, which I wouldn't say there's necessarily anything wrong with, but it's good to be able to appreciate the sound of the melody on the guitar in that lower octave as well. I think that it can actually sound better a lot of the times, and I guess the point of what I'm saying is you don't have to be afraid of playing a melody in that lower octave basically clashing in the arrangement and not cutting through. It depends on the context obviously, but you know like for example if you're in an organ trio and you're doing that type of thing, the melody played in that lower octave works incredible. So yeah, this is just a quick side point, but in terms of practicing your melodies, this is definitely something good to be aware of and if you haven't been doing this already. Try playing your melodies in the lower octave, if possible. Alright, so, let's take a look at these changes now. So, first of all, this song was composed and is typically played in the key of E-flat major, and as far as the form goes, it's pretty much the same kind of form as what we had with the tune You'd Be So Nice To Come Home To, which was one of our examples from the last episode, if you haven't seen it. And as you can see, it's essentially an A, B, A, C form, and those are 8-bar sections, but you can really just understand this as two similar 16-bar halves or sections with different ending variations, which it's usually the last four bars or eight bars again in this case. Now, just like the other examples from the last episode, I didn't make this chord chart here myself, and while I don't think anything is fundamentally wrong here, for me personally, I may have written a few, you know, not too significant things differently, but this is actually okay because these different ways of perceiving what is essentially the same basic functional harmony taking place will contribute to some of the points that I want to make here. You see, like I've been saying in the last few videos, even though there are definitely times where we may want to articulate every harmonic change that might be written into a tune, and it could definitely work and sound good, but it's still helpful to realize that usually there's more significant harmonic change points in a progression than others. And if I were to generalize, these significant points would usually be either when the harmonic form is really suggesting 
an arrival of some sorts to another um, tonal center of the key. And just to remind you, the three main tonal centers of any key are the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant. Or when some sort of true key modulation is actually taking place. So from this, we can realize that all the chord changes that might be happening that are not occurring at these significant change points can tend to be viewed in a more flexible way because there isn't as much significant harmonic change happening and therefore the harmony can be perceived in different kinds of ways that are still functioning similarly. So if we start by looking at the first four bars, there's a lot that I can point out already that relates to what I'm kind of saying. First, I want to note that although this chart shows bar 2 as having a G minor 7 to a C7, you may commonly see it written as just a C7 for the whole measure or even the more truly diatonic C minor 7. Understand that all these little harmonic variations are, for the most part, functioning in a similar manner in terms of how it's fitting into the context of what is happening musically in the bars before it as well as after it, and what kind of role the harmony is falling into to be able to create a musically logical and smooth transition between these two points in the form. So I really just like to see this bar as some sort of C chord or the sixth chord in the key of E flat major, ignoring the G minor just for a second here, and this basically turns the first four bars into our familiar 1, 6, 2, 5 progression in the key of E flat major, and each chord gets a whole bar. Now, just a warning, I'm going to be rambling a little bit again about the 1, 6, 2, 5 progression, but we should notice that this chord progression is just one example of what we may call a diatonic cycle progression. And for those of you who aren't sure what that is, that's really just when you have a chord progression that either starts on the tonic chord or the one chord of a key or not. It can go either way, but if you do start on the tonic chord, from there you're going to jump to some other chord that exists in that key. And from there you're going to work your way back to the tonic through this consistent chordal or root motion of diatonic fifths until you arrive at the tonic chord. So we only have a limited number of these diatonic cycle progressions in any given key, and that's just because there's only so many chords that belong to any given key. So if I were to demonstrate these in the key of E flat major, since that's the key of the tune today, starting with the shortest possible diatonic cycle progression and making them progressively longer and longer, and keep in mind that for the shortest one, that would only have one other chord in it other than the, uh, the tonic. And because these are working through the circle of fifths, essentially, diatonically, the closest one to the root would be the chord that actually is a fifth away, the five chord, which most of us know. So this would basically be a 5-1 progression, you know, in the key of E flat major. Or like I said, you could start on the one, one, five, one, right? So, moving along from that, most of us should know that the next chord, a fifth away from that, is the 2 chord, the F minor in this case, in this case, so you can have a 2, 5, 1, or you can start on the 1, 1, right? So, after that, like I've said, we have the 6 chord, so the diatonic chord is the minor, and maybe you'll have a whole measure of that and then a half of the next two, so something like 1, 2, 3, 4, just as an example, you know. Or we can make it dominant, like if we were to start on the 1, the way we've seen it is a turnaround progression. Right? So, after the 6 chord, the next one would be the 3 chord, which is what we see in bar 2, and that's why it's there. 3, 6, 2, 5, 1. We started on the 1, you know, maybe something like 1, 2, 3, 4. You know, put a little bit more voicings or motion in that one. So, after the 3 chord, the next diatonic chord that is a fifth away would technically be the 7 chord, the D half diminished in the key of E flat. But you can put that in front of the 3 chord, but what you usually see if you were going to extend it any further, which is the last chord in this key, 
would be to go with the four chord instead. So in the key of E flat, that would be like your A flat major seven. And just to show you, first of all, that chord is already kind of similar to the D half diminished. It's still a tritone away. They're not both dominants, but you could turn them into dominants. But even if you analyze it as if it was an A chord, like a D half diminished with an A flat and a bass, that would basically give you an A flat major six chord with a sharp 11. So it's like a Lydian six chord, you can call it, which is kind of cool. You know, but either way, it's closely related, so you can see it as a substitution. But even if that wasn't the case, if you go from E flat to A flat, the bass motion is just a half step above the three chord, so it also works good for that reason. And if you were to turn it into a secondary dominant, so you would go one, and then next one would be the four seven, A flat seven, that also voice leads or is like the tritone sub leading into the three chord, but that is the tritone sub now of a D7, so they're related, okay? And after that, if you were to go up to the next fifth, you would be back at the root. So diatonically, because of that tritone at the end, it loops around on itself, okay? So a lot of this is probably familiar and redundant for some of you guys, for sure, but I'm explaining all this to make it clear that any and all of these diatonic cycle progressions in any key can all be seen as relating to one another and therefore can all potentially be approached in identical kinds of ways. Everything depends on context, as I'll explain in a second, but understanding this basic point can be huge for you in terms of keeping a more harmonically simplified foundation in your head so that you aren't always feeling frantic trying to keep up with every single change as it's going by. Like, I gotta hit this one and this one and this one, especially at fast tempos. So, like I said, as far as how we may find any of this over-analytical nonsense that I'm talking about helpful... Jazz is stupid. <laughs> Jazz is stupid! ...in any kind of way really depends on the context. And I would say the main things that would influence this would be the harmonic rhythm of all the chords, basically how long each of the chords last within the form. And this just goes along with the form in general if you're considering things like where a certain chord may specifically land within the form or stuff like the evenness of the number of bars of particular chord progressions or sections within the form. Like a lot of times you have these things that may fall within like these four bar chunks, for example. And the context is also influenced by the tempo, which is amusing to me because this also technically contributes to the absolute harmonic rhythm of what's going on since the tempo is literally influencing how long the time each chord or whatever is going to last for. Now, with all of this, if we finally take a look at the tune, I said that we could look at the first four bars as a 1-6-2-5 in the key of E flat major. And although this isn't the same chord progression, it's pretty similar to a chord progression that we had in the second example in the last episode in that that progression was also a diatonic cycle progression in the key of E flat major with a similar harmonic rhythm. I already mentioned with the other progression from last episode that you could be flexible and choose to articulate every harmony, or you could keep it diatonic and simple and just think E flat major. But understand that the reason why this context allows me to be more flexible is because the chords are lasting one measure each, or they're lasting a little bit longer, regardless of the fact that this tune is usually played pretty medium up to up tempo, and that does have an influence because in the situation where we had the same chord progression but it was a ballad, you absolutely would probably want to articulate every change. So, like I said, everything depends on context. So, if we consider everything that I've said and go back to bar 2 and now look at it with the G minor 7 chord in it again, we could see that both of these chords relate to the key of E flat major 7 as functioning as a sort of tonic sound, since these are the 3 chord and the 6 chord in that key, and those both function as a tonic sound, along with the tonic itself, which is what we have in bar 1. Therefore, we could say that since there isn't any significant harmonic change to a different tonal center in this particular context, 
we're more so able to look at the harmony then in a more flexible way as well as take a diatonic simplified approach if we want to which is what I've been talking about. Another thing to note about this situation is that we have space in the second half of bar one and if we consider what I said before that all diatonic cycle progressions in a given key can be sort of seen as related to one another then just like we did before when we basically took our 1, 6, 2, 5 progression and extended the diatonic cycle further by putting the 3 chord in front of it, you know, we can extend it out further. Now, the next one in the cycle is technically the 7th, but like I said before, the 7th and the 4 could be related, so it's common to go the 4 chord, and we put that in the second half of bar 1. You know, and that's where that comes from. So, in this context, we don't have to do that, but the option is available there, and I guess the point is, you don't have to think that it would be incorrect or interrupting what the original harmony is doing anyway from a functional point of view. Now, whether you choose to imply this four chord, or this actually is the chord progression in another tune, you should realize that even though this four chord is actually a different tonal center of the key now, it's the subdominant, in this context, it wouldn't be considered a significant harmonic change in my opinion because of also what I said before. In order for it to really be a significant change, I think the ear clearly needs to get a sense of arriving at a new tonal center. And in this context, that chord would just be one chord in a succession of a lot of fast moving harmonies that are eventually leading you somewhere. So therefore, it would kind of be excessive to even articulate that in that case. Um, and you would want to maybe do it more diatonically. So, the first place that you really could say that there's a significant change here would be in bar 3, the F minor 7 chord. Now, this is subjective what I'm going to say now, but although we could definitely say we're arriving at the 2 chord here, which is conventionally in the subdominant category related to the 4 chord, and we could certainly imply this specific change to this tonal center if we were soloing if we wanted to, from a more generalized perspective of essentially looking at the functional harmony as being grouped into different sections or fragments of the form, I would say that we could generalize both bars 3 and 4 as primarily serving a dominant function. And I think examples like this really show why we often group the 2 and the 5 chord together in jazz as sort of being the same sound even though they classically belong to different tonal centers. Now, let me explain this a little to clarify. Say we were to look at the different ending variations of the A section of a rhythm changes, which I talked about in part one of this topic. Now, just to go over it really quickly, we're in the key of B flat and coming out of basically the four chord, or the four, seven, whatever, in uh, bar six, you know, Ending variation number one, like I said, could either be like a one, six, two, five. It could be a three, six, two, five. Um, coming out of the four, it, some people might just go to the two for a whole measure, and then a five for a whole measure. And then if you notice what I'm doing here, like a pattern, you really, coming out of that four chord, can just stay on the five chord for all those two measures. All right? So that's the first variation, any of those, uh, you know, variations of that. And then the second one is basically coming from the four chord, quick two five to the tonic, right? So in both these variations, they use the same chords, but the difference here is from a functional point of view, you're always ending up on the dominant in the first variation. And those two bars in that case is similar to what we have in this tune with the two five. I think Overall, it serves a dominant function, and it makes sense because it's taking you back to the next A section, or at least in the rhythm changes, that's the first ending, and that's your dominant, which releases to the tonic at the end. But in the second variation, it's more about an arrival to the tonic, even if we're starting on a two chord or a five chord, because you can also come out of it, you know, just stay on the five chord for the whole measure. And that's different. That's giving you more of a sense of arriving at the tonic, and then you go into the bridge. So as you can see, you can almost approach these first four bars in a lot of, you know, variable ways, even though they're all related. You know, and you could play the two and the five, you could play just the five, you can imply just the four sound. 
So there's a lot in those last two bars. But even for the whole first four bars, you can, of course, just keep it diatonic and think just E flat like I was talking about in the last two episodes. And I think it's important to remember this because before I move on, finally, just as an example, what do they do in the melody here for those first four bars? They go one, two, three, four. And that's really just a C minor with an add 11. And... That's the relative minor, and that's one of the main things that you should actually take from this. Over all those chords, the relative minor of the key, even just the triad, works great. And we know that the relative minor is related to the uh, to the tonic, the E flat in this case, but the relative minor, or just that minor chord, is also a good substitution for the two chord. So whenever you have a two chord, like in a two five one, if you think of the minor seven chord that's down a fourth, that really gives a nice color because you have the fifth of that chord, the flat seven, the nine, and the eleven of the F minor. So it'd be like a F minor eleven chord basically if you were to play those notes. So that's a really good way to keep it simple and diatonic is to use the triad of just the relative minor. Alright, so now we can finally move along with the rest of the tune and hopefully I get through these changes a lot faster. So if we now look at the second four bars, we can see that it looks almost identical to the first four bars. The difference is only in the second half. So instead of a F minor 7 to B flat 7, which is our regular 2-5 in the key of E flat, it turns into a A flat minor 7 to D flat 7. And related to the key of E flat, a lot of people would recognize this progression as what they call the backdoor 2-5, which is, you know, your minor 4 cadence, basically, because... The A flat minor is the minor four chord in the key of E flat, and you can simplify your thinking to just that. Um, you know, and this is the flat seven seven, so it's that two and five pair that goes together, and it's basically a substitution of a different two five that you could use that works functionally still within the key of E flat major, even though those two chords aren't actually in that key. And the other logical way to see that is if you thought of those two chords as just D flat seven, like I said before, D flat seven and B flat seven are related through the diminished and they're in the same family of dominance. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you can watch my video on functional diminished harmony or you could watch a bunch of Barry Harris videos. So because they're in the same family, you know, they can be substituted out for different sounds. All right. So. Just like in the first four bars, even though the first four, you would say, is more truly diatonic, this F minor to B flat actually is in the key of E flat major, and you could just think E flat major, therefore, the whole time for those first four bars, but the F minor could be a good change point. So, similarly, in the second four bars, the A flat minor 7 is a significant change point, if not even more of a significant change point, because even though the A flat minor is functioning within the key of E flat, again, it's not actually in that key. So if you're playing a phrase coming from before that and then going into that bar with the A flat minor, you definitely want to be able to articulate that harmonic change, okay? And when you articulate it, like I said before, you can think of it more as like a minor four sound, or you can think of it as the dominant, the D flat for both bars, or you could articulate both as always. All right, so now let's move along to the first ending here, and we're going to look at the whole eight bars, because the first four bars of this is, in my opinion, the same thing harmonically as the second four bars. And I don't actually agree with how all of this was written, but it's like I said before, that's actually a good thing because it helps us to be able to see how these different substitutions of chords that you could use can also work because they're being used for the same function and they're working in the same way, even if these substitutions have different sounds themselves, all right? That's the beauty of it. So, first of all, let's just look at the second four bars first, just so that I can point out that you should notice that this is a traditional 3-6-2-5 progression in the key of E flat. And I've already talked plenty about how to play over that, so I'm not going to have to say any more on that. But I want to start here because this is the conventional progression and how we should see this as functioning. But I actually don't think the C7 is correct. I think it should also be F sharp minor to B7. But understand that that substitution is providing the same function. So the C7 
especially as a secondary dominant, but even if it was C minor, is leading us into the F minor in a logical way, moving through diatonic fifths. So the F sharp minor to B flat seven, and let's just say we thought of it as B, uh, not B flat, B seven. <laughs> B7, if we just simplify that to B7, is not the same thing as C7. So this is a very clear substitution. It's a different sound, but it's functioning the same way because let's actually just think of it only as F sharp minor. We can clearly see we have the chromatic moving uh, motion that voice leads perfectly into the two chord where it arrives, all right? So this is a different way of getting there and it's a different sound and you'll see this sometimes as well, all right? Now, coming into this ending, like I said, we have that backdoor 2-5. And if we're thinking of it in that sort of sense, that backdoor 2-5 is typically meant to take us to the tonic, which in this case is E flat major. So this ending ends or starts on G minor, but remember the G minor is the three chord in E flat major and it's still functioning as a tonic sound. So in essence, it's resolving still the same way, even though the root is different, all right? And that's why you can almost in a certain sense think of that first bar as E flat major, you know, harmonically instead of G minor. They both work, but you definitely want to be aware of the fact that you're resolving to a tonic sound. And if you thought of it like that, you might notice that that progression then turns into exactly what you have in the tune four, where it goes, right? Um, that's a more common tune. So, um, so it's the same thing. It's interesting to note that the bass line that Paul Chambers actually plays on the recording at this point in the form, at the beginning of this second half, <laughs> begins with the note B flat, which is the fifth of E flat major and the third of G minor. So it's an interesting note to start on in that regards, but then he more clearly defines a G minor like with that triad, and then for the F sharp, he just plays that. So that's what he's playing there, which is just interesting to think about from a harmonic perspective. Right. But if we thought of it as the G minor, that's a good way to think of it because then you can clearly see all the chromatic motion of just the minor tonalities. If we just thought of it as A flat minor for the two bars coming into it, you know, one, two, three, four. You know, I mean, nothing too great there, but that's how you want to think of it, because if you can visually see those chromatic moving minor tonalities, it's easy to come up with good phrases that sound good. And before I move on, I would also say that in that situation, it's typically good to really just use pentatonics or minor seven arpeggios or triads, because, you know, technically the G minor is like the three chord or the Phrygian tonality in that key, and like the F minor is the uh, Dorian, and this is technically out of the key, so but it's passing, but you don't want to have to get into those differences of modes and all that because it won't sound as good. So the best thing to do is just keep it pentatonic and chromatically move it down because it's going to be the same thing and create parallel motion in a good way, in my opinion, all right? So you can approach those progressions like that. In a sense, you're moving chromatically with these minor tonalities, all right? And then... Finally, if we look at the second ending here, first we'll just look at the first four bars. So we have B flat minor seven to E flat seven, A minor, A flat minor seven to D flat seven. So this is just two consecutive series of two fives that the first one leads into the other because this B flat minor seven to E flat seven is a two five of A flat, but it's landing on an A flat minor, which is totally fine. And then this is another two five. So the only thing I'll say here is every time you land on a different minor chord, if we're coming out of the back door two five at the end of the first half, you know, every time you get to the next one, so that would be now, that's a significant change point, and then when you get back here, significant change point. And that should be obvious for all of us, but the only reason why I'm pointing that out is because the fact that we're pairing these twos with fives so that we can clearly see these progressions as two series of two fives, 
that sort of tells our ear that the B flat minor and A flat minor are not diatonic in the same key because it could be like that. For example, if we were in the key of G flat major, the A flat would be the two and the B flat would be the three chord, but that's not really the sound of what's going on here. And the fact that we have these two fives, especially, you know, right here, that sets up our ear to kind of recognize it as a harmonic change point that you want to be able to hear, all right? Really rambling here today. So, Though you want to be aware of those significant change points and, you know, use your 2-5 language, you know, think of it more as just the minor or just the 5, like everything I've said so far. And then finally, the last four bars is just two consecutive cycles of a 1-6-2-5 progression in the key of E-flat, which just keeps turning around on itself until it gets to the top again. And I've talked about that extensively already, so there's not much to say. You can thank E-flat for the whole thing. You could think of the first two bars as like a 2-5 line that could resolve to an E-flat in bar 3 there. Lots of options. You can articulate everything, but you certainly do not have to articulate all those chords there. And it probably wouldn't sound too good if you did, alright? Quickly, I want to say that what I really think they're doing is, in the first two bars, it's not so much about 1-6-2-5 or a 3-6-2-5 as much as I think it's that chromatic 2-5 again, so the first bar would be, you know, F-sharp minor, B7, and then the second one would be F minor, B-flat 7, and then the last two bars there would be just your regular 1-6-2-5 or any variation, okay? So, I'm just gonna leave it there today, and make sure you go back to the beginning and watch the clip of me playing again, just so you can hear, you know, some of the things I may do over the progression now, uh, after considering all the things that I said, alright? So, if anyone has any questions or anything they want to say, please put it in the comments. I'm here to help. And in the next episode, Hope you're ready for the next episode. Hey. we're going to continue this topic again, probably just looking at one example, maybe two. But the good news is I said a lot of the information already in today's episode. So there's no way that it could be as long as today. But who knows? I always say that, right? So... That's it, and if you enjoyed this video, I would appreciate it if you gave it a like and consider becoming a subscriber as well as a contributor to Patreon where you get all the PDFs on this channel for only $5 a month. And if you think anyone else would enjoy this content, please share it with them as well. And I'll see you guys in episode 41. Swinging and playing the blues. That's what we, that's what we about. I try to help you.